Yeah, so I did this two years ago, and I guess uh, that means I'm experienced, but I've been so nervous for some reason. Uh, so I'm trying to just remember, like, there's so many people here I know from the meetups that uh, I've made friends with, so um, I'm trying to just chill out. But uh, here we go. So leading an enterprise to the public cloud, uh, what's that even, what's that mean? Uh, I work for a company called iLoan. Um, the, it's a kind of a division of Springleaf Financial, which is a huge company. Um, so in Chicago, like we're hiring, everything is kind of iLoan branded, um, and it's a super fun place to work. Um, but this talk is about the enterprise. So um, to go in that, just a little background on me, I've been doing kind of technical work for, I don't know, 18 years, something like that. I was traditional IT, I've done, I was like the help desk guy before we even called it the help desk, um, to high performance computing, and then what I would basically call like high traffic websites or mission critical websites for the last six, seven years in the, in the DevOps space. Um, and you know all the automation of Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Docker, all of those kinds of things. Um, but the last, like my talk two years ago was very, kind of compliance and auditing driven. This is this talk is very enterprise driven too. Um, so, but it's about the cloud. So what is the cloud? Uh, Google, Google knows, it's bullshit, right? Uh, and I, I wanted to give this talk, I was tempted to like, you know, every time I'm gonna say cloud, like say cloud, you know, butt instead, if you've seen that like browser plugin that turns the word cloud into butt everywhere. Um, so I'm not going to define it. DevOps is not really defined. We all know what it is. We're here. Maybe you're learning, but it's not. It's not like something you can go and definitively say what it is. I think the cloud is is similar. Um, but what we know is that people are using the cloud. People are moving to cloud more and more and more. Uh, and just some factual stuff. I mean, Amazon Web Services. Um, it's approaching $10 billion a year in revenue. It's pretty amazing. Um, Am or Microsoft with Azure is kind of newer to the game, but doubled um, year on year, $800 million. Um, is, that a, is that like the end of QT or the whole year? I don't know, it's just ridiculous amounts of money. Um, but what you, what's happening is, like Amazon, it's not an equal distribution of like who's using Amazon, right? Uh, or, or the cloud. And, so like the old man yells at the cloud and millennials are to blame for everything. Um, and I was, uh, there was, so like an enterprise, what, is it, what does an enterprise mean to you? And, and I can be a bit flippant about things and I should probably be more polished, but I, the first word that comes to my mind is terrible. Uh, <laughs> so like if you want enterprise software, that means I want some terrible software. Um, and you know we've got enterprise practices. What does that mean? It's like change control with you know multiple layers of approval and like just weeks gone by. So I'm thinking terrible and trying to. So on the on the right side, I try to think. Oh, there's some other things. Like I'm as an engineer, I'm excited about problems like hard problems to solve. You get those at scale. Like you don't get scale if you're not making any money. And once you are, like you sort of become an enterprise. Um, and then you have that money, so then maybe you can do some greenfield work, um, and you've got deep pockets to, to do fun and interesting things. Um, I'm getting so excited by security uh, kind of problems because it's like, all right, I've been doing infrastructure automation for quite a while. I can run in another Rails app is not that exciting to me. Um, but suddenly we've got millions of customers, their data from you know, their credit reports and their bank accounts and all of this kind of stuff, and nobody, I want to protect that. I want to, I want to do as good a job as that, so that as possible. So that that's kind of exciting to me, and you get to at scale like that's um, a bigger problem to solve. Um, so you know, I mentioned iLoan. We're tiny. We launched our business um, a year ago, September, and it it, it is uh, you know it's it's owned by Springleaf. Uh, Springleaf is 90 years old. Um, and they acquired one main financial, which was their bigger competitor a year ago. So just like scale, you know, 2,000 something branches where, you know, you want to, what we do is essentially we lend money. You want to borrow money, you go into a branch and you're like, this is who I am, this is my driver's license. Um, and they, 
just for kind of a, a scale, like they, they've lent out 15, 14, 15 billion dollars. You know, collecting interest on that. That's a pretty good business to be in. Um, so that's great, right? Um, except uh, brick and mortar businesses aren't necessarily the future. Um, and really any, um, any business, you have to, to innovate. So you find yourself, in, you're an enterprise now, you're a victim of your own success. How do you, how do you continue to innovate um, so that's, that's kind of where iLoan came in. And this is, this is before me. I joined iLoan uh, 15, 16 months ago, about four months before they launched the business. And uh, they were, you know, development environment was already in AWS. Uh, the decision was already made, like, it's going to be in AWS. That's why they hired me. I've been running production applications in AWS for six something years. Um, so, um, it's great. Uh, I didn't really even know about the parent company that much. A little bit of a bait and switch there. Um, I'm not bitter. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's like, you can do everything. Um, and so we did, and it's great. Um, but what I found out over time is like, all these exceptions got made, right? There's audit really wasn't particularly involved, and SOX, and uh, InfoSec was pretty hands off, because it just wasn't material. Uh, you know, I think initially we had no business value, right? We had no customers. Um, we weren't making any money. So, but over time, I mean, it, it's important because it's, you know, it's something we feel is very, like, important for the future, but, like, materially, the number of customers, the amount of data we're protecting, um, it, it, it's not the same. So they make all these exceptions. Um, and I just want to point out, like, it's a, it's a valid business in its own right. Uh, I mean, it's super important. I would not want to take that away from the people who work on iLoan at all. Um, but for me, it's, it was also very much a, a proof of concept. It allows us, it allows the enterprise now to, to do this again. Um, and why do I want to do that? I want, I want more problems, I want hard problems, scale, all of that. So what's happening, uh, what happened in that Chicago office, is a brand new office, brand new team of developers, new ways of doing things. Uh, you know, you ask pretty much most companies and development teams, even when they're really, really awful or terrible, um, they think they're agile, because um, agile is just like, of course we're agile, it's been around since 1999 or something, um, yeah. But they're not particularly, and DevOps is like, you know, I'm a DevOp now, my team, we're the DevOps team, like, it's, resistance is futile, that's what we get called. Uh, even though I think, hey, it's about collaboration and, and things like that. Um, but this, this team in Chicago, they're really solid people. They, they get that helping each other is important and um, that we're kind of like all one team and in it together and just the DevOps way, so to speak. Um, and along with that, like how do you operate that? You, you kind of throw away all the rules and you say, this is how we're going to do it. Kind of, I hate the expression, but like as if we're a startup. Um, and, but we are doing things like continuous delivery, re release when ready, we're shipping code multiple times a day. Um, but you hire a person like me and also just the, the other managers are very experienced, they've run businesses at scale. Uh, we're, this is not the Wild West. Like we take security uh, and all of these kinds of things super seriously. So um, the kinds of things that we did with iLoan really paved the way to do some other things. And so what we did was we brought, brought in outside security consultation, right? Like, don't take my word for it. Who am I? Does it, you know, it's like, is there some credential that like, would make me, my opinion valid? Uh, probably not. So the things we asked a security company to do is say, like, this is our network architecture. Does it make sense to you? Does it, you know, is it secure from like, you guys are the experts. That's, that is your industry. That's your, your value add. Like, tell us. How can we improve it? What kinds of security appliances should we have? This is what we have in mind. Um, and does it make sense? And it's, it can be very different than an enterprise because I'm going to use open source technology and I'm going to build some things myself. I'm not always just going to look at the magic quadrant and go, yes, I'll buy two of those, please. Um, so we also had a formal risk assessment done. So we decided to, for all of our controls of how we manage risk within the company, we would adopt a, a NIST 853 standard for everything and ask the security company, like, what, sh what should we be doing differently or better? What can we improve? Um, and that, that was a good process. The, the output of it is you, 
or I guess the, the risk assessment part of it is they come in, they interview you, they talk to everything um, about how you, how you release code, how you test your code, how you, you know, harden servers, things like that. And you end up with this uh, risk register of things that you need to mitigate. And, um, an easy example is, oh, I've got a VPN, the only access to all my AWS infrastructure is through a VPN, but it doesn't have MFA enabled, right? So MFA is a good thing. Um, so pretty easy, like, you go add, you know, integrate MFA into your VPN connectivity. So that's, that's a simple example, but they give you this tool that helps you manage your risk and pay it down over time, and it's complicated. I, I won't go into that anymore, but, um, the, out, the output really is like, there's all these technical things you should do better, and then there's a whole bunch of policies that need to be written. If you don't have it written, like what you do to keep a secure posture, it's almost like you don't get any credit for it at all. Uh, and so maybe that's my talk from two years ago, is you should be writing these things down uh, and make them auditable and things like that. Um, another thing we did, um, really without being asked by any part of the, the parent company, was to, is to form a information security management group. So we took, basically, me, I have a security engineer on my team, the two kind of heads of development, we're like, we need to talk every month about new vulnerabilities or patches or just security projects, implementing web application firewall, this, that. Just talk about what we're doing, put it in writing, and share that information. Um, and so we would do this every month, and then quarterly we'd invite, like, executives from even higher up, and we would, we would share this information. So kind of the, the thing for me there was like, I'll go back, but uh, the more you share, the more trust you get, right? So another one we did was, you know, okay, like I said, we're not the Wild West, we, we get pen tested. In fact, we did two rounds of pen testing for iLoan. It was, you know, a year and a half to make enough that we could launch. Um, right, but, you know, a few months before launch, like kind of do an initial pen test, where are we? Okay, now we're, we're ready to launch another pen test, find more stuff, fix any high or critical finding before we launch. Some things we can put post-launch. Um, and then, so everything's cool, and then I get, a, I get an email one night from my boss, he's like, hey, you guys got red team pen tested last night, and he, he worded it ambiguously to make it sound like they, were to, they broke in. So I wake up to this and I start panicking, looking at logs, what do they do? What do they? Anyway, I find out like they got nothing. They, um, they weren't able to have any findings at all. Um, and the nice thing is like they took my team out to dinner and spent like a ridiculous amount of money uh, at a very nice, fancy place. And it was like you felt appreciated, which was good. Um, so all this is kind of going on and you've got this like these, these dev teams that are you know fast throughput. Um, and somewhere along the line, I, I found this thing, I, I've started reading way too much Gartner stuff, mostly to be able to speak uh, to executives. Um, and this term bimodal IT came out, and if you've never heard of it, it's kind of worth reading, but I found it and it just resonated with what was happening. You've got this like fast moving department, uh, able to iterate and, and like measure and observe like What's happening on our websites? What are our customers seeing or doing? And respond to it. Like you see something that needs to be fixed and you can fix it really, really fast and the rest of the company is more, you're gonna, it's gonna take time, there's a lot more effort, there's huge teams of manual QA. And, and I'm not saying that's bad, like there has to be because those systems are older, they're harder to kind of, you can't just turn them on a dime. Um, but I, I took a little bit of umbrage with the idea of, of bimodal IT and that like it's, it's kind of a recommended good thing to have like a slow moving part of your company and the fast moving part of the company. That, that's actually not bad, but the idea that if you're moving fast that you're also now insecure um, or unsecure, whatever that word would be, and then um, the, essentially that you're like cowboys, right? And, and like, I'm like, we can move fast and be safe and stable and secure and all of those kinds of things. So uh, if you're familiar with Jez Humble, he, he kind of put everything I had been feeling into writing and articulated it way better than I ever could. Um, and, it, and it's like, here's the flaw at the heart of that. Um, so moving along, um, you know, like I said, iLoan was kind of our entrance into this. And I think because we were doing a good job, 
Um, you know, one of the guy who heads up the Springleaf.com web development team, uh, who's they're in Chicago. This is this is again like a, a kind of modern dev shop, fast moving, continuous delivery. They deploy even more frequently than the iLearn team does. Um, and he's like, but I want to be in AWS. And can you help me get there? So I said, sure. Um, you know, I'd been, I've only been at the company at this point like four or five months. I didn't really know 100% what I was signing up for. And I also, I kind of thought like, hey, I'm going to do the technical work. Um, but actually most of the next like eight months was convincing the business that this was a, a good idea. Um, so that's kind of what the rest of it is. And my, I guess the, my main caveat was I have to hire somebody else. I think the more you do, uh, the better your automation has to be, the better your test coverage has to be for your infrastructure so you can make changes in a safe way that, that you've not just kind of left technical debt for the future behind. Um, and so we, you know, I'm like, I have to hire somebody. Um, so hiring is really hard. Um, I'm probably guilty of wanting one person that can do all the things um, because, I don't know, like, the other sense, like, we're not out in Amazon just yet, and iLoan is so small, not making money. How big should my team be? So I can't, I can't have a whole bunch of different people. I have to have a pretty small team, and they kind of have to know how to do everything um, or be able to learn it. Uh, so that took me six, seven months to find the right people. Um, and this, this kind of, you know, like, there's a report here that, um, you know, I would have thought the top concerns would have been security related or compliance, but actually the lack of resources, like finding people um, who've done this kind of thing before is really hard. And you know, exa knowing exactly what the re that skill set is, is, is also hard. Uh, I actually don't care if people have Amazon experience because I view that as probably the easiest thing to learn. Um, so, all right, so we're gonna do this thing. We're gonna bring springleaf.com out to the, uh, to the wild cloud, and you know, I think I skipped past it, but half of all new business comes via that website, so it's it's critical. Um, and there's suddenly there's no like, oh, this is a, a minor part of our, you know, presence as a business um, in front of our customers that we're going to make exceptions for. Everything has to be approved and above board. I didn't even know who the stakeholders were. I had no idea how to get approval for this, um, and so maybe we should have had a plan. I, I had no plan. Um, so I just kind of asking questions in the dark, who does this, who does that, um, kind of find my way to the right people. Um, I, I guess I just want to say this, like, this talk is kind of a journey of what happened. It's not necessarily like, this is going to work for you. You need to copy all this. I do think there are some things to be learned, though. So what we did was I just started asking people questions and, and figuring things out. Um, I eventually learned like there's a bunch of stakeholders and this is my fake little org chart. Can you see the whole thing? Um, and I had to kind of appease people within IT and InfoSec and internal audit and SOX and like I was part of the product development so that was easy. Um, but then there's even cyber risk and legal. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about each of those, I think. Um, probably my first conversations with IT were probably November-ish, and you know, we explained the network architecture, service-oriented architecture, like how we do everything that we do. And I kind of thought they'd be like, wow, that's, you, guys are, you guys are so cool. Um, and I thought maybe it'd be like a collaboration, and, and they really just looked at me and were like, you, you're gonna be busy. Like, I got, I got no problems, but you're gonna be busy. And, and I'm like, oh. You're not going to help at all. Like this is just us, okay? Um, and so, like some of those same people were involved, and but now we're talking like infosec and networking people. And the networking team was probably like the most technical that we worked with. Um, and they're like, "What does this network look like? And can you draw a picture?" And I gotta say, I drew a network diagram so many times that in June, an aud so you know, six months later, an auditor said, can you update the network diagram to show where this one firewall is? And I just said, no. <laughs> just like, I'm done. I will print it out and draw it with a pen. Like, I'm not going back into Visio or ever again. Um, so I'm, I don't know, I'm not the most 
I think that's like a DevOps failure or something, but I, I don't know. I, I just, you reach a point. Um, so, kind of the things we're gonna talk about are listed there. Um, the shared security model of Amazon, or, and I would think this would be the same with Azure or something else. Who's responsible for what? Like, I don't have access to layer three down in Amazon to know what's going on in their network. I have no idea what their hypervisors look like or how they perform or how they keep me safe from some other customer, but um, they give you a nice diagram. And we, we talked about this, um, and I'm like, I, like, they secure the cloud, I secure what's in the cloud. Um, and I don't know, like I talked about this a lot, but it's really hard to tell. I always think people understand me, and then they go, I don't have any idea what you just said. I'm like, okay, I'll try again. And um, the network architecture was similar uh, in that I would, I'd, so I'd say, hey, Amazon, if you look at their VPC, of course we're gonna use a virtual private cloud. Um, they give you a few different examples of how to configure it. This is scenario two. You've got a DMZ and you've got a private network. Um, and there's things in, on that drawing that, that people ignore. Uh, I think they're on there. Maybe, maybe it's not even on there, but um, that's how I've always built. Um, I've always built things, and people thought it was like my idea, and so they didn't trust it. Because who am I? I've been there now five, six months. Um, these people have worked there 20, 30 years, so I'm the new guy, and they don't know me, and uh, so why would they trust me? We have an external security company saying this is good. But still, we're not really getting like, yeah, that's, that's good. And then NIST published a standardized architecture for enterprises in AWS. And that was in January, and I was like, yes. It's not my opinion anymore. Um, and it's a little hard to tell, small diagram. Google those words, you'll find it. But it's essentially, it, you're getting back to a three-tiered architecture um, that enterprises love. Um, and it's okay, all it meant really was like, I've got my ELBs in the DMZ, I've got my application servers in a kind of middle tier, and I've got my databases in a different tier, segregated at a network level. Um, and that's a good thing. And then we have connectivity back to the data center. So this was, uh, you know, there's things we have to access in the data center, like if you have a, if you have an iLoan loan, you cannot also have a, a Springleaf loan. We need to be able to like, talk to each other and figure out, um, like you probably could, but depending on the state, there might be different, like a limit on how many fees we could charge you or as a maximum we could loan to you. There's just a lot of laws. Um, so there's APIs that we have to interact with across that wire. So a direct connection is encrypted. Five minutes, whoa. All right, so uh, I'm prepared for that. Um, InfoSec was like, I want all these tools. And um, I just basically said, okay, um, we will do all of those things, except like some of them don't make sense. You cannot, like a software-defined network, you cannot snoop on it the same way that you can snoop on a co corporate network um, router or switch. Um, so we had to, we kind of had to evolve the stance to Let's use, let's have parallels for all the tools we have, and we'll use the same ones if we can. Um, and then we can always kind of iterate later if there's a better way of doing things in Amazon. Um, something's completely lost in translation. Um, security groups and network ACLs, uh, it's, I, I basically think these are, if, if you can't buy it, if it doesn't have a label, if it's not a, a next generation firewall, then it, it, it basically doesn't count. They're really, really powerful. Um, and hard to get set up correctly as well, and I could talk about that. Um, they want to know, you know, okay, we're doing everything different. Are we throwing away all the rules? Are you still hardening servers, controlling access to things? Are you encrypting your data at rest and transit? Yes, 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 yes. We're going to do all those things. We'll document it. We'll share it with you how we're going to do it. Um, Again, we bring back a, a security consultation, uh, get a new risk register just about the Springleaf infrastructure. Another pen test, because um, it's different applications than the iLoan one. So here we get to, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm working with teams, we gotta get kind of higher level support. And this is where I am start reading things like American Banker and Wall Street Journal, trying to be like, 
what financial service companies are going to the cloud. This is not where I, well, this is not my comfort zone, but they very much want to. They, nobody wants to be the first, right? They're like, are other are other banks and financial companies doing this? So start going there. Um, skip some of that. Um, so really, this, this is key. Uh, we put all of this in writing. We had a written business case, like why are we doing this? What's the scope? How, what are our concerns? And if you capture people's concerns in writing, it allows you to kind of argue back or suggest an alternative. That was probably the most essential part of getting this greenlit was having it in writing and just kind of continuous, just relentlessly following up and addressing concerns. Um, I'm just going to skip some of this. Audit, SOX, um, cyber risk was the last one. And finally, at, on June 20th, they're like, we have no concerns, which is their way of saying, go for it. Um, so now it's time to build. That meant we also we acquired one main. They're like, that's, that needs to launch in AWS too now. That's, if that's how we're going to do everything, your deadline for launching that is 10-1, cannot be changed. You got 12 weeks, build everything, right? Okay, we got this. <laughs> so this is fine. Uh, this, this is also fine. Um, and anyway, that's kind of the end. There's, there's several lessons learned um, that I could talk about if people want to know more, maybe in a breakout session. Um, but we'll say no, no executive cares about your technology. Chef, Puppet, Docker, serverless, immutable, just totally worthless to talk about. Um, Pick your battles. Um, I really just fought with like, if this is going to create my team more work, either now or in the long run, I will fight. If it's like, you want me to send some logs somewhere else, okay, I'll send some logs. I'm also going to do like log analysis myself, um, but there's no harm. Uh, one last one maybe is uh, confusion grenades. I never heard this term before, but I was accused often of lobbing confusion grenades. People ask me a question, I start answering, and I completely misunderstand either what they wanted to know or an effective way of telling them. So we helped each other a lot. I very rarely would talk by myself. We'd have other people and it'd be like, I would try, I'd see eyes glaze over and I'd be like, hey, uh, Ron or Gino or somebody, like, I wanna, can you guys try? Like, let's, so you gotta, you gotta come at it from a lot of different angles and um, that was huge. Communication styles, like some people don't uh, respond to email. Uh, they, <laughs> They want phone calls and voicemails. This is crazy to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's you, if you understand how other people want to be communicated with, and it's important to you, you got to meet them where they're at. You can't just wait for them to come to where you're at. Um, keep your qu requests simple. Um, you know, relentless following up is is really the key. Um, and we got. Uh, four weeks left to launch all of this stuff. Uh, so I've been a little stressed, but anyway, I probably ran out of time, skip to the end. Talk to me if you want to know more. Uh, so. Thank you, Brian.